Milwaukee is inherently one of the racist cities in the nation, most segregated in the nation. There are only two races in this country that face legal discrimination, and it's uh, whites and Asians. Why do we need to help everybody and not help the people that are here? Would you concede on some level that 50 or 60 years of affirmative action is a form of reparation? Hell no. No. Oh, no. Everybody else got no. a big check. You would like me to bear responsibility for actions committed in the past? No. But that's you, what you're but saying. You, that's not what I'm saying. No, I just I said what I'm saying. Yeah, Rana okay. said that if she, that if she <laughs> talks about You don't want to hear what I'm saying. <laughs> The candidates in the upcoming election approach issues of race from very different perspectives. America has a long history of systemic racism. I will eliminate all diversity, equity, and inclusion programs across the entire federal government. In this episode of Swing State Debates, I'm in Wisconsin to speak to voters about how they think about race and racism in 2024. I have to solve racism in an hour. Oh, oh my God. Hey. How do you solve racism well, nobody in an said hour. we were doing that. I'd just like you to go around in a circle and tell me who you are. A little brief introduction. So let's start with you. I am Skylar Croy. I'm an associate counsel with the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. I work on the Equality Under the Law Project, which seeks to vindicate uh, the constitutional rights of individuals across the country. I'm Rhonda Hill. I am the founder and director of an organization called Race and Faith where we work with groups and individuals looking to be more anti-racist in their practices and or policies. My name is Charlene Albuquerque. I am the director of the Black Republican Coalition. And I'm Martha Berry. I am retired and I was formerly the chief racial justice officer at the YWCA Southeast Wisconsin. And my name is Corey Houston. And I just recently started a nonprofit called Politics Impact People. And also, I volunteer for the GOP in Milwaukee. Let's start with an easy one. Um, <laughs> I'd like you all to give me your definition of the word racism. I'm just going to go with the traditional um, understanding in a way that I've learned it is racism is power and privilege um, put together to the disadvantage those who don't have the same power and privilege because of skin color. I think racism starts with a level of prejudice, but I think it's deeper in that it's not just an individual situation. So I think the privilege and power, it's like a three-legged stool, and all three of those, privilege, power, and prejudice, contribute to making racism what it is. Um, I would give it just a more narrow definition as similar of just judging someone by their skin color. Uh, it's, not a it's a learned behavior, not born that way. Rhonda, you mentioned what I have learned was it was this. So can you talk about where, where did you learn this sort of definition of racism? Personally, at a personal level, in college was actually my first experience with like interpersonal racism, that direct racist action from one uh, individual to another. A few years after that, I took one of Martha's courses oh. um, at the YWCA is called Unlearning Racism. And from there and through my work, I really just became more engaged and decided to really take it on as something that I wanted to do myself. I think one of the problems with the idea of sort of systemic racism or structural racism is that it's, it can be a very amorphous concept. And for that reason, it's not always clear how we take that concept and do something to correct it. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Tyron Lannister on trial in Game of Thrones when he says, they, they, the ominous they. And it's like, well, what is they? Who, 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 is, who is doing this? I'm just not sure from that perspective that it ends up being especially helpful. I wouldn't go with an amorphous they. I think there's places where the institutions have helped to embed certain things. So, I, I mean, there's lots of institutions we could think about, and I'm not an expert in any of them. So I was just thinking about housing. So if you look at um, redlining and what that did in our country, it made it tough for, I'm just gonna pick on Rhonda because I know her. Um, if you were trying to look in my neighborhood, which is mostly white, although there's people of color in my neighborhood, would you be shown that house? Would you be shown that neighborhood? Would you be assumed to be okay? But then it's not just, could she find something? Would the bank give her a loan 
that would allow her to have access to the money to be able to do that. And in Milwaukee, it's been particularly challenging for families of color in that a lot of banks weren't willing to loan the money. So when you talk about an institution, I'm just picking housing, we could pick any number of other things, but you know, it's, it seems like there's ways that um, many of those different groups were in cahoots with each other, I guess for lack of a better word. So certainly there are racial disparities that exist in this world. I, I would think everyone here would agree with that. I think the, the issue becomes though an assumption that when those disparities exist, it must be caused by racism. If you look at the 2022 census data, the top five ethnicities in terms of income None of them were white. It was Indians, Filipinos, Iranians, South African, and Lebanese. In fact, 71 of 71, the, the very bottom was Appalachian, so rural whites. I think when we look at something like uh, a purported disparity in housing, for example, if we're gonna actually address it, I, I think we need to get granular about it and get down to the actual evidence of discrimination and tr try and address it at that root core uh, from a policy perspective. Well, it is certainly true at least that because of racist policies of the past, black Americans on average were not able to build wealth in the way that other Americans were. I mean, that I don't think we, would you dispute that, Skylar? Again, I, I think when you just look at the, the census data, again, the, the, the top five households, or the top five ethnicities right now are Indian, Filipino, Iranian, South African and Lebanese. If we're talking about something like white privilege, how, how do we factor in the fact that uh, Indian households are earning an average income of $152,000 a year? Uh, and, and again, the Appalachians, which rural whites from particular regions of this country are at the very bottom with about $50,000 in household income. So I, if we're concerned about an income disparity, fair enough, but I still think the way we would address it would be at the individual level. If we're talking, say, like an affirmative action program for college financial aid, why can't you just provide that aid to poor students? Why does it have to be provided to students of a particular race? Okay, Marcy. Um, so where did those statistics come from? What was the source? That's the census data for, for the last U.S. Do you know, census. the majority of black people or minority people do not even answer those surveys. So those numbers are very, very, very skewed. And so one of, one of the things for me is the problem is with a lot of people of other races, I could say Caucasians or Appalachians, as you uh, so nicely put it, is that nobody comes to the neighborhood and check out what is actually going on. Everybody looks at everything from an aerial view and tell us that we are okay. And so with those statistics, you would almost say that there is there is no poverty, there is no racism in America. You got the Indians on top and the and, and where, where the is African the African American and the, the white people on the bottom. So it's those bad statistics that you use that would have everybody thinking, we the, the the new wealth class of America. Well, and, and it's just not true. Milwaukee is inherently one of the racist cities in, in the nation, most segregated in the nation. And so, and they also use shared revenue, which takes the money from the north side of Milwaukee and use it to fund projects in the entire state of Wisconsin. And while we have roads that have been bad for 30, 40, 50 years, I'm 47, so I drive up and down those same roads that have been broken for the last 50 years. We equally pay taxes on the north side of Milwaukee, but our taxes are not going back to us because of statistics like that that say there's no problem over here. What I hear what you're saying is like, well, if you say that Indians are number one, and people from the Appalachia, white people from Appalachia, we're the are the bottom. bottom. We're at the bottom. So well, then, we correct. And we don't even have a name. So who is Sub-Saharan <laughs> well, Africans? I'm, I'm sure it ain't it's, us. I'm we're, sure it's in there somewhere. Where are they at and where are they from? But he, I even I got a problem with the term from. African-American. My yeah. husband, who's from Libya, oh, okay. immigrated here, is an African-American. Mm -hmm. I'm just American. And so, if, I mean, if we look at that, if you want to say black American, white American, I mean, all the terms are just skewed and throw it off. And so is again, bad data like that, that 
uh, leaves us where we are and it, it creates more problems. You're right. saying that it's looking at the issue of racism from the point of view that if you have group X that is doing better than group Y, or if there is a standard to be in group X and the uh, group Y is not making that standard, then the standards must be racist because the group doesn't fit the demographic. The, the more interesting conversation I think to have is when we only look through the lens of race, what else are we not seeing? When we talk about racism as a black family, we are, it is born and indoctrinated that there is racism. These are the things you got to look out for. There's a green book on how to travel through Wisconsin, through cities, how you got to navigate. Currently? We're, there's still a green book. Absolutely. There are certain, Whoa. there's still sundown towns and places that we can't go as black Americans. Mm -hmm. So when we get down to, if, if you guys never acknowledge that there is still racism, there is still oh, yeah. systemic racism. Me as a mother of five black young men, I have to tell my kids how to act. When you go here, this is what you do. You have to make this call. You have to sit, be still, put your hands out the window. Um, don't make any sudden moves when you're getting pulled over. I have to groom my sons on how to act in white America. What you just told me seems like examples of, of cultural racism, I guess. I guess maybe I struggle with the word structural based on what you just said, because it sounds like you're, you've just related examples of, of individual instances of racism that you might have to deal with. So, but it's the, the structure, oh, the power structure, right. the power structures. Well, then you wouldn't have to deal with that. So, Use them to oppress. Right. But, but the, so to push back on that, though, j just a little bit, obviously there are racist people in America, and those people should be, should be named, and they should be punished, and the, the, the victims should be compensated. I think, though, when we talk about systemic racism, at least the first thing that comes in my mind as a lawyer and an advocate is the laws. And I will just straight up say there are only two races in this country that face legal discrimination and it's uh, whites and Asians. And in fact, I have a, uh, a case right now at the Wisconsin Court of Appeals over a scholarship program that the state of Wisconsin runs. It's the Minority Undergraduate Retention Scholarship. And that scholarship is uh, given out only to certain races, and, and one of them is not Asian. I'm not aware of any laws or programs in this country that specifically discriminate against black people, Hispanic people, Indians. I feel like there's a question of using race as a proxy for class. Oh, that happens a lot. So I think Skylar's point is that if, if you just help people based on economics, you're going to disproportionately help black people. Does it not make more sense for our policies to be about economics as opposed to using skin color as a proxy for economics? Do you really want people to think, I can't do better than mm -hmm. I'm doing because of my race? Is that the message that we want to say because, my, because this outcome is going to be determined by my race? That's what we're teaching in some ways when we focus on racism no. only. No, that's not what that means. If I hear, if I hear that is. I never, that the desperate I impact, that outcome is because, oh, I, no, it's not because I can't learn because of my race. It's well, I, I would agree, I, we wouldn't want to be no, saying that. I'm saying we should look at it. But now what he's saying is, don't help just the black people. He's representing a Thai Asian, person. Thai, Hmong, under the same laws as um, you would somebody from the civil rights or a black person that was discriminated against. And I just, I, I don't, think it's fair. So they, a Thai Hmong person did not come over here and was on slavery and was uh, neglected and not giving the same resources. He just came over here and now he get to fall under the guise of the same laws that was put in place to protect African, as you call them, or black Americans. Now everybody is trying to get on the bandwagon because, oh, I'm the only Thai over here. But yeah, you weren't over here for 400 years building a country, um, being starved, being beaten, being raped, and not allowed to build wealth, generational wealth. You weren't redlined. You wasn't told that you couldn't get a house in Wauwatosa until recently, 1964. So the guys that you're trying to put all these new people under, because now they all Americans, because they all came over here, because we cannot define what's American, what's African American. We don't have proper terms for people. Now everybody's just, I, I just want to get in on the bandwagon because I'm going to get some money.
like they just did with the MIT study that came out when they got rid of affirmative action in schools. I mean, I wasn't a surprise. You're so passionate about him, but not at the people that's right here, that's been here, that's been building the country. Mm. Now, oh, let me, another social service or humanitarian project for your law firm. He's Thai American, let me help him now. All these black people suffer. Even, help the poor white people then. There's so many people that's living here that's poor, impoverished, you go to Thai and see how much financial aid they give you. So, so then why would you not agree with a program that, fo- that focuses I, I on economic I agree that when, when they give us back what they took or redlined and stopped us from getting, then help everybody else. America's problem is we don't have our own identity and we go helping everybody else. We feel in the war here. We feel in the war there. Why? Why do we need to help everybody and not help the people that are here? We don't help veterans. Hmm. We don't help homeless. We don't help poor whites or poor black people. We helping everybody else. We got billions and billions of dollars in debt to other countries and have not helped the people right here on our own doorstep that we call citizens. I think part of the, the problem here is, is the innocent third party, okay? What so, innocent so, third party? They come in here milking the system and y'all let them. Can, can I But if we my... do it, it's a crime. If they do it, it's okay. Keep going, Sadler. Thank you. The Students for Fair Admissions decision, which was the, the Harvard affirmative action case from just mm. a couple of a year, I maybe two study. years ago. One of the issues in that case is that college admissions, unfortunately, is zero sum, right? There, there is a finite amount of spots in a freshman class. And that's unfortunate for so long as it is zero sum. Harvard did not want to take Asian students. It held Asian students to a substantially higher standard. And it did that because uh, it was worried that if it went off ACT scores, SAT scores, GPA, uh, those kind of metrics, which I understand can be controversial for other reasons, but if it went off those metrics exclusively, uh, there, there would be too many Asians and it didn't want that. So what it did to, uh, and I think it did it with, with good motives, right? It wanted to make up for all of these problems that, that you're seeing, all of the, the racist past and, and all of these issues. But the, the way that it got there was to victimize these Asian students. And, and I'm, I'm struggling to understand what from the, the kind of systemic racism, uh, institutional racism perspective you, you, you do with that. Because even if I concede that it all exists and that it's, it's a really heinous problem and we need to fix it, there, there are situations, and not all situations, but there are some situations like that where it seems like the policy solution that's being proposed is to take it out on people who had nothing at all to do with any of this stuff. Not, and, and their ancestors didn't have anything to do with it either. But it's interesting in terms of thinking about Harvard. We've sort of elevated Harvard as like the place to be able to go. And what makes Har- a Harvard education better than say UW-Madison or UW-Milwaukee or whatever, but I, I'm You get not, to say you went there. That's what makes it right. better. Right, there you go. Well, that's okay. not quite fair, that's, but yeah. big but, part of it. But it is, but I don't disagree that there needs to be some looks at some of those things and be challenged. You know, like Harvard needed to be challenged in terms of what are you doing? You know, like that's not transparent. And I think every institution should be as transparent as they can be about what their standards are. I don't disagree in the places where we've lost our way But I still want to go back to what you were saying is people that have been here a long time are not getting access to some of those resources while the newbies coming in are. And is that fair? Okay. So (laughs) Wisconsin runs a diverse suppliers program. It gives out uh, about $200 million a year. And and the way it works is that if you are a minority-owned business, you get what's called a 5% bid preference. Okay. So if you say, I will sell pencils to the state of Wisconsin, and I'm going to charge the state of Wisconsin $100. If you're a minority-owned business, the state of Wisconsin treats that as $95 for a bid. And if a white business owner or a minority who is not within this right the category right? bids 96, they're going to lose. So I, I, I think that it is, and I, I bring this up just because some of what your, your argument I, I took to be that well, who really needs to attend Harvard? It's it's maybe not that important. And I just it sounds like I'm trashing uh, Harvard. I'm well, not the, trying the, to the trash people Harvard. That are, again, why are we defending Asian American or whoever they is or Tao when we still got problems right here in America? We still haven't solved the black and white problem. 
Does it strike? Which I think that's the core of all of it. Like w- how we and keep, everybody else is just running under the guys. How we keep having these um, types of issues and clashes, and it comes through because we we've, we've never had a true. Um, I want to add more stuff to on the band on top of the, the ways in which, but never fix the wound. Black as descendants of slavery, particularly have had that treatment and had to deal with white people this whole time. Every other racial group kind of hits the crosshairs of that. And I'm not saying that it's fair, but I'm saying that's what happened when you have unresolved issues. You know, when we think about South Africa and doing truth and reconciliation, we've never told the truth about our nation in terms of the ways the nation was built, et cetera. We haven't? Yeah, I wouldn't no. agree with that. I, well, what, I, what, I, what, like, what do you mean? Well, so when you're saying what you're saying, don't know. if we haven't told the truth about how our nation was built and what was done to the native people that were here and the genocide that the happened. The BIPOC people, correct. We haven't told the truth about most Absolutely. of that. And if we haven't told the truth, back to what you were trying to say of, what are we, what are we trying to address? I would say, if we haven't told the truth about a lot of, a lot of that stuff, we're going to just keep piling because you were saying the band-aids on top of each other. And I'm thinking we don't know the truth because it's not taught to us. We don't talk about it. It's not brought up. Okay, so tell it. Okay, maybe we are not talking about it enough. But to say that we're not, I don't agree with that because I know that my kids have learned it cycle after cycle after cycle. doesn't mean that they shouldn't. But we always say you and I are unicorns, though. We got to get the masses talking about it. This is an excerpt from an executive order, I'll let you guess from which president, that prohibits federal contractors from holding workplace trainings that teach things like, quote, an individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously, or that anyone should feel discomfort or guilt because of their race. What do you guys think of uh, this proposed regulation that Anyone who wants to work with the government should not have any kind of workplace training materials that espouse any of these concepts. Overall, it's, I think, very difficult to take issue with any particular statement that is in this. Uh, In particular, uh, and I I know this might be controversial to say, but this sounds a lot like MLK's position from his his famous speech of, uh, I want my children to be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the contents of their character. If you um, limit that bears responsibility, then that kind of X out how you can't talk about the ways in which people, particularly white people, have benefited from racism of the past, which could be important in a workplace setting. So this this was part of a tr- Trump executive order. So this isn't yeah, uh, aspirational or hypothetical oh, thing. Is. This I, was part I, of I Trump executive order. Don't with surprise it. me, so, so, it sure look like it. So Trump passed this because he said that even in the Treasury Department, people are being taught, uh, don't encourage people to be colorblind, don't say things like judge people by their individuality, and, um, and people are being taught that, that white people should feel uh, uh, guilty about, um, about the, the country's past. Right. So that's what prompted this is that workplace trainings were doing this. So knowing that, what do you guys think of those ideas? I mean, people being taught. I mean, that's my work. That's what I do for a living. So (laughs) I provide trainings. Yeah. And I talk about race in those trainings unapologetically with no problem. So with that, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. Um, And number one, I can't make you feel guilty. You're you own your own feelings, I can produce and share information Then you choose how you want to respond to that. So Mm -hmm. I don't, I think it's necessary to have the cultural sensitivity trainings is sometimes what they call them that way. A lot of people don't want to say they're doing anti-racism training because it's so heated. But for those people who do want to have and have that direct anti-racism training, I provide those too. And we can really talk at and look at the history of race in the country and then how it shows up now today. And I think that that's healthy, that because these people all then show up in a workspace together. How do you show up and work with these types of um, things at play and not address them? Well, some, yeah. Just to point this out, I, I think there's very little evidence that these reduction of bias trainings actually do reduce bias. And I, I think the evidence is actually even lower 
when people are compelled to do it, uh, compelling people to take reduction of bias training. I, I am not aware of any data that w would support that that would work. And just so that the audience maybe has an, an example of the kind of thing we're talking about, uh, the American Bar Association is now requiring first year law students to uh, go through this kind of DEI reduction of, of bias training. And uh, the, the University of Wisconsin Law School had a big scandal over this about six or seven months ago because it gave a handout, and I have the, the quote here right from the handout, quote, racism equals racial prejudice plus systemic institutional power. To say people of color can be racist denies the power imbalance inherent in racism. I don't understand why that kind of ideology needs to be taught anywhere. And I, I, the other point I want to make is that at least that particular training, and I think some of these trainings more generally, it got really weird, like just really, really weird. There was a point where the students were told to fill out a survey, and one of the questions was their scale of agreement from one to five on whether, uh, quote, people find me attractive because of my race. There were law students who th said to themselves, why should I have to sit through this? And I, I don't really see the harm in saying, if you're a government contractor, right, and, and you want government funds, you can't waste time with this kind of thing. I mean, the, the, the government itself shouldn't be engaged in, in that kind of ideology. From, it, but from the information you already presented earlier, you've already proven you don't know how racism works in this country. So this is why you have to have those conversations, even if people don't like them. I, them asking and making that that's statement. That's a really strange question about attractive in terms right. of that's weird. But I can get why they may say that about who, really? Well, it was a, it's a study that came out from the um, psychology magazine that says mm. black women and Chinese yeah. men are the most unattractive people. Think how people think mm. about people who are mm. obese. Mm. Think about how people think about, okay, even skin shade, which we get in our own culture. The lighter you are, the more beautiful people think you are. Mm. The darker you are, the more unattractive people. So me having hair like this, natural, well, we already have big conflicts and fights about what's considered professional hair. Right. So appearance and race go together. But isn't, isn't the and case- And that comes up in your job. Isn't the case though here, one of the things you said that you don't want anybody to feel bad. Basically you're saying that as an individual by virtue of his or her race, sex bears a responsibility for actions committed in the past. I don't but want to do do be able to not talk about benefits. I feel like when, if they put this, if this is in but that, that's of course, not, then you block, you're gonna, Use that somehow to block me from talking about well, the, ways, I mean, that, I the mean, ways in which people I do think. benefit from. From, okay, so I benefit from being white, is what you're saying. And who would like me to bear responsibility for actions committed in the past? No. But you like but to, you're, but you're, just, I'm telling you what I would like to talk about. Okay, but you I would, would like, like to talk, talk about specifically, benefits. But you disagreed with F, F being a Because F love. will keep me from talking about. Benefits. But you don't want you. But you want to talk about how I am a, as a white female. Now I have I bear some responsibility here for the past. That's what you're saying. That's not what I'm saying. No, I just I said what I'm saying. Yeah, Ron is okay. saying that if she, that if she <laughs> talks about who you don't want to hear what I'm saying. If she no, talks I, about who I, has I benefited from, I just said from, what I'm saying. If okay. she talks about who has benefited uh -huh. from the past, someone is going to feel like, oh, now I feel responsibility for this, or I feel. I mean, it, or you're this, like you're this, trying it, to say this, and, and it's like, okay. The, I mean, which is what I mean. Look, the, this this order is trying to stop DEI workshops like what Rhonda does. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, we can quibble about right, like right. this language, but like at the end of the day, like that's, that's why she okay, objects so to it. So she's it. saying benefits. I, I understand. I'm sort of putting that conversation with the earlier conversation. That's not, thing that we have right, come not, to terms I'm with. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty or anything, but I think it's the awareness. It is sometimes white people and some people of color too, that are still not aware of how much racism plays a part into what is or what is not. Mm -hmm happening. And so then mm -hmm. when something mm -hmm. does happen that is centered in racism, mm -hmm. people feign shock and surprise because we mm -hmm. don't address and talk about it enough. Do you feel like we don't talk about race that much? We don't. We, 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 what we end up talking about uh -huh. is when something happens. Okay. We talk about the one-off. So like some of his studies, uh -huh. we'll talk about that. Like, okay, the Thai student didn't get admitted in because of this policy they just uh -huh. preference it that's what we'll talk they're about not, we we don't oftentimes get into this whole systemic 
really conversation about it. I, I, maybe we don't. I don't agree that it's systemic. So uh, maybe well, we could. I, I, so maybe that's I why. I meet a lot of people who, who believe that too, and yeah. they want to keep it in the one-offs. Yeah. But when you keep it in the one-offs, then you can't address some of these these larger policies. So this yeah. this a policy this, that blocks. This, what about this idea? This idea that, and I, I don't know if you said you support this, but that was addressed in the executive order, that colorblindness is something, an ideal we should avoid. You know, like, like when, when I was growing up, this was the ideal that you should, that you should not treat people differently based on race. This was a sort of foundational mm -hmm. uh, value mm -hmm. that I was taught as by liberal progressive people growing mm -hmm. up. And so, I mean, I don't know if it's part of your training, but it yeah. does seem like this is part now of our sort of nouveau anti-racism, that colorblindness is an ideal that we shouldn't there's something problematic about that. So, like, where do you where do you stand on do that? Do you believe and, in the golden rule? Yeah. And I would say, I do not believe in the golden rule. Uh. The golden rule is treat people how you want to be treated. I would say, treat people how they want to be treated. So that requires that you have to get to know that person in order to treat them the way you, they want to be treated. <laughs> if you just treat people the way you want to be treated, then you're only coming from your your mm, ideas, your mm, paradigms, mm. and then that your cultural norms of what you think is acceptable, which means that you can bypass what they need to feel comfortable, what they need to be safe, and what they need to be seen because you feel like, well, I'm just treating them the way I've been taught to treat people. So it, it takes, it requires us to go a, a step further. So that's what I would say about colorblind. The colorblind idea would say, it kind of glosses through and just say, well, we're all, we're just all people. We're just all God's creation. We just all here. We all bleed the same blood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And exactly. Okay. But now I have specificity. It's specific things about me. If you try to treat me the way you treat her, she has clearly shown up as an individual. We are not the same people. Well, I, I think Martha we agree on that. Martha is no, a different person. I just want to pick up on, on kind of the end there because it sounded like what you were saying is that we should treat people as individuals, which is what I've been saying this entire time. That, I, th that is exactly what colorblindness is, right? So again, I, I hate to keep harping on, on the college thing, but it's just, it's, it's a really good way, I think, of conceptualizing this. Y you can have a, a race-conscious, race-based program that says we're going to give financial aid to... Uh, black people, but but that's going to be over inclusive. Like, wh why does Oprah Winfrey's children need the benefit of a program like that? And the answer is they don't. And and when you consider the individual needs and you treat people without regard to their race, uh, I, I I I just don't see why that's a a, a bad thing. Now, if someone has been and that's victim, not what I'm saying. Okay, you okay. didn't hear me say that. Well. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not entirely sure that I that I followed. I said I don't like the the color blind is just this like one swath like like semi like oh I don't see color. But, mm, that's that's not. No, really, that's just. I mean, that's, that's in denial. I mean, anyone who says when I don't I, see that's color, way, like that's, that's crazy. That's the way I've gotten color blind a lot when people say that. that, that that's a caricature. It's, of the it's, argument. It, but it's also. I mean, color blindness. No, is it's a, not it's a, a caricature of the argument if that's something I've actually experienced. No, so, <laughs> people so, saying, "Oh, I don't see color." Yes. Well, they, they don't. They don't mean that literally. Because they don't right. say we all bleed the same blood. Yeah, but but it's a metaphor. If they don't, a metaphor for what? Do you know where the metaphor comes from? It, well, see, explain to me. This is going to be a part of a white niece that I don't know yet. Explain it to well, me. Well, it, it comes from Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson, well, where, he, where he was, th this, this was separate. Uh, th 1890s. Plessy, right, thank you. This was the case that established the legal principle of separate but equal. And there was one justice who dissented, and that justice said, our Constitution is colorblind. And what he meant by that is that our legal systems should should look at individuals we don't have a caste system and it took until brown v board of education for that dissent to become the law of the land and and that is the phrase that, that is where the phrase colorblindness comes from and and it is a, a caricature of the argument to say that colorblindness means in some literal sense we don't see color of, of course the vast majority of people see color but then there's the next step of whether our laws should treat people differently based on on that basis, and I, I just they can't. But, but, Charlie, but yeah. why? <laughs> but, but, but why? I was going to ask you, what do you think of the colorblind ideal of treating yeah. people based not on just um, based as, treating people as individuals, not factoring okay. skin color? If we if we just talking about twenty twenty four, fine. 
I was gonna say to him about uh, color blindness. And so, but you see what they did. They made a law to fix it. Where's the other laws to fix the rest of the stuff that was done? Laws that are saying, this was the wrongs that happened. Let's fix them and move forward. We're talking about re reparations, so, which I mean, you know, I mean, absolutely. That's, cool, so right? if we go through repara <laughs> if, so reparations is 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 the way that we're going to be able to move forward. Are, and I'm are, actually are you going to put a bandaid on my wound and heal it and heal my generation, or you can't go back and do something. The only uh, thing that you could do was uh, pay me for the work that I've put in, the cotton that is, my dad is 83 years old. Uh -huh. He never got paid for picking cotton. But how much money did y'all make right. off of that cotton? Right. My dad's still alive. Right. Uh -huh. He was born in 41. Right. Nobody uh -huh. gave him no money for picking the cotton. Uh -huh. Let alone the sharecroppers that were supposed to give them the land uh -huh. kept uh, hoodwinking and bamboozling them out right. of that same land. Oh no, you didn't pay enough for it. Right. Or I gave you that free meal, so now uh -huh. we can't give you the land that you worked. Right. So he's still alive. Uh -huh. That stuff that happened so long well, ago that we can't correct, right the wrongs, as I keep saying. Just right the wrong, give my daddy the money, even if you don't mm -hmm. give it to me. So I think there would be a lot of practical problems in actually trying to do reparations, but, in, in, but just to point this out, uh, I, I'm not sure that this nation has ever truly tried colorblindness, okay? So we had slavery for hundreds of years. After we had slavery, we had Jim Crow, had that for many decades. And then we went right to affirmative action. And I, I don't think anyone here has argued it explicitly, but there is this belief that, well, colorblindness, or as I would probably prefer to call it, race neutrality, okay. uh, just can't work. And I guess my point would be, so I'm, I'm not sure when as a society, other than maybe the last two or three years when, when some people have tried to do this, but I, I, I don't think there's been a prolonged period where we've actually tried to to do this. To my original point, we have such a difficult time in this country wrestling with what, what people would say is one of the original sins of this country is racism. And so why would we be surprised that we haven't had long periods of time where anything was, was race neutral? Which I understand what you're saying, even on the other end where we create these benefit programs that's based on race to try to mitigate some of those things. I know you're not speaking for that as as I would, but I am in agreement with you. Yes, we haven't had any prolonged period of time, whether we're trying to do something for good or whether it's all these devastating things um, because we have a serious issue with racism in this country, which is that's what makes it systemic. Would you concede on some level that 50 or 60 years of affirmative action is a form of reparation? No. No. no, no, no. Everybody else got no. a big check. <laughs> Let's talk about what is being done. Um, when Biden got into office, he repealed that Trump executive order. On the first day of his office, he wrote the following. The federal government should pursue a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all. And affirmatively advancing equity is the responsibility of the whole of our government. For instance, the order required federal agencies to create a plan for investing specifically in underserved communities. I mean, everybody would agree with equality. We all want equality and want to enjoy equality. But equality of outcomes is disparate impact. Equality of outcomes is different than equality of opportunity. Say it's more. different. It's different Say because more. you because you, you cannot guarantee the equality of outcome. The, the, everybody's outcome is based on a variety of things. Mm -hmm. It's basically saying, uh, first of all, there's no standardization because in the, in the equality of outcomes, we all have to end up at the same place. I get it that we can all start at the same place, and of course, this is. Kamala Harris's thing, that what we all have to end up at the same place. There's too many factors that determine mm, where mm, people end up. Mm. It's, it's their uh, meritocracy, their, their working ethic. It's their family culture. It's their intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's their schooling. It's their decision. Like, there's a many, well, many things. It's like, just let not racism be one of those things. How about so that? Is well, that I guess thing. I would want to know what that <laughs> means. Fine. because so Let's just not let that be one of them. But, but, I, we, but if racism is already, or racial discrimination is already illegal on already, the federal level, the question is what, what more can you do? And, and, yeah. and it's Martha, it's illegal to rape so. people, but people still get raped. Well, they get raped a whole lot less because it's illegal. I mean, you know, there's only, <laughs> no, no, is it's that wrong, to, Skylar? To, to, so so I, 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 I think we got to back up for a second. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and I think this, this goes to, to your yeah, last point, Corey. We need to, think for a second about whether equality of outcome is 
actually something we care about. Okay, because we just want the opportunity. Or if it's possible, that's all we keep, want. Keep, keep going, keep but, going. Yeah. And, and I would agree that equal opportunity is really important, but equal opportunity is very different than equal outcomes. So again, just to go back to a, a stat that I gave earlier, 54% uh, of NFL players are black. That's no one thinks that's a problem, and it's not a problem, and I'm not saying it's a problem. But I don't know. what percentage I don't of the know owners if, are white? I, exactly. I'm about to say I don't know I, about if nobody thinks that's a problem. He little, talked that, about the employer, NFL, and he doesn't hear anybody complaining about that. Of many. And I'm saying one that that's employer not true. out of many. How many right. other companies are so white dominant? You talk so, about one compared to how many companies. Then you have to think about, point is just, even in that, mm. you have to think about why is that? Yes, yeah. and I just want to be very clear. My my point is mm -hmm. that just because a disparity exists doesn't mean you can conclude there's discrimination. To give one more example, I'm left-handed, okay? Six of the last 14 presidents have been left-handed. That is not evidence of some left-handed new world order to put down on the, the right-handed majority. That is just, for whatever reason, how the car cards have, have played out. So, and I, there'd be, it would be silly to even say that we need some kind of uh, right-handed affirmative action to correct for that. So, so my point is, to the extent that what equity means is equality of outcome and that we should strive for equality of outcome, I'm not, I, I just, I can't, I can't agree with that. It seems to me that the aim of these various executive orders and the and then there are executive orders like for each, there's like one on uh, um, uh, Hispanic uh, equity. There's one on, there are two on black equity. There's one, I mean, it's what you were saying about the segmenting of the population, but they say that the point of these is that we want the workforce to reflect the diversity of America, which means if you sort of read between the lines here, like they're saying we want agencies to ensure that, for instance, the staffing levels uh, mm. reflect demographics, which in effect, I think <laughs> means that you are going to, on some level, be hiring people and promoting people based on race. So having sort of like presented it in that way, like what do you guys think of that? Is equity the same as equality? And I don't think it is. No. And so shouldn't it be about equity in outcomes that where you start and where you end is gonna look very different? Because I think the example you gave. You could call it a different thing, but when you're saying equity and equality, how are you, what are you, how are you those different? Because equality, it's like I equality. So we all took our shoes off and put them in the room, in the middle of the room floor. We all have, two shoes on, right? Mm -hmm. And then I said, let's all grab. I might end up with one of yours and one of Ben's. So I've got two shoes, but I'm probably not gonna get very far walking in those shoes. So that's a quality, right? We all had the shoes, throw them in, we all got two shoes. So you're saying some people are start, their starting line is behind, right? There's some people it, are behind, it, like yeah, people start here and other people start here. It, yeah. Well, okay. well, equity is made, just meeting people where they need to be met so they can be successful. So everybody doesn't have, you could just, like she said, just the two, just because you all got shoes don't mean. But if the thing that, 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 that a person needs to be met where they are right. is preferential treatment and the, and getting a job that maybe someone else is more qualified for. I no, mean, is, see is that, it, now that's well, that's the what booger. I'm asking. No, that's so the book, where that, is the that, part that, where the That's where the happens. racism come in at, because that's always, you know what I say about DEI? That Definitely was the next earned it, baby. It ain't, I ain't get here because I, you let me here because I can't read two sentences? No, I can't even get past the interview if I don't have certain qualifications to get here. If the job says that you need to have a, um, a bachelor's degree, to get this job, that's the minimum requirement. I'm coming through the door with a master's degree. Okay. Because, so I didn't, you didn't just give me this because I look black. You didn't just give me this because I uh, am female. But I got this because I have qualifications for it. Now, the fact that I have one of those identifiers and that may serve your company meet, need, then so be it. But you better believe I'm not coming through because I don't have the skill set or the knowledge base to be there. Well, it's nothing given, yeah. that's not, that haven't been given to me. I and I'm about I'm... to be overqualified, like so many, especially when you start talking about um, black women, overqualified. Well, we, we would all want the same thing, of course. I mean, to, 
That's an interesting comment because, of course, we would want people to be judged by what they bring to the job. We wouldn't want someone to be judged by their color. That's, I guess, why we're arguing or why there is a conversation about... And I'm about just saying people just assume that about people. Sweep us like people have been calling um, VP Harris. Oh, she's a DEI hire. Or even me. I've been, I'm, the, I'm the only black in a lot of spaces. Right now, I do a lot of stuff in outdoor recreation. Do you know how many people of color are in outdoor recreation of any shade? No. Close to well, none, baby. Absolutely. That's a billion dollar but industry with hardly no right. people of color. Okay? Yeah. So don't tell me because Football. I work at this camp and I become a director at the camp that I'm a DEI hire and it's 98%. <laughs> I'm just like, some of this stuff just be laughable. Well, it wouldn't, it, wouldn't it follow that if you have a proponent that says we have to, we have to uh, train consistently the principles of DEI, wouldn't that be setting yourself up for that feeling? If, you, if you're training people that, hey, we got to look at race, we got to look at race, we got to look at disparities, and then you don't, I mean, I wouldn't see you as a DEI hire because I would listen to, do you know the job? Do you seem to be a leader? Do you have the qualifications? If somebody doesn't see that, they, that is to their detriment and they, that would be negative, right? Right, I'm saying on the system. outside, don't just assume that any person of color got a job that they were not qualified for. So you don't for. want me to judge just you based because on that or they on are the race. a person okay. of color. So that's, we agree. I feel like that's a lot of the racist yeah. kickback from that with affirmative action or anything else. Yeah. It's like, oh, you just only got this because you were black. Baby, I got this because I'm so, qualified and probably yeah. more qualified than you, probably more qualified right. than my boss. Right. Right. So right. don't, but don't without say the, that. But without, without racial preferences, there wouldn't be yeah, a reason for a anyone to think that your race had anything to do with it, right? But it wasn't our race no? that caused the law to be enacted. Exactly. It was your and race. And it wasn't our race going for racial preferences. Skylar, Skylar. <laughs> because the so that was a, a, in essence, the that's right been wrong. In, in place for a long time is this. And everybody else is trying to figure out how can I get more to that. So I do think it is racist to look at a particular individual who is black, Hispanic, Indian, whatever it is, and say that particular whoever they are, right? It, 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 whoever that particular person is, and to say that particular person benefited from affirmative action. That is applying a, a, a stereotype to that individual person, and th that to me is, is I would say, the sort of the definition of racism. However, I think there's a big difference between talking about whether specific individuals benefited and whether groups benefited, because it's undeniable that the, the very point of affirmative action is to benefit certain racial groups. So I, I think that we have to at least all concede that on, a, on average, there are beneficiaries of affirmative action and that it, it's based on race. Yeah, because your race was inherently racist, and now it's a wrong that you guys are trying to my, right. My race so was now not you had racist. to put. Do you mean to say that? I'm Do you mean to sure. say that white people are inherently racist? I didn't or... say that. No, that's what you said. No, I, I know. Got, I'm I just told I you my family like is Kim folks. Yeah, We're yeah, the yeah. melting pot. Yeah. Uh, I got white friends. I'm mean, like y'all say I got black friends. I got white <laughs> friends. No, I don't believe white people are inherently racist, but there have been some things that have been done by all of our ancestors that we are not proud of. And again, we would never have this conversation or have to put this stuff on the book if the world was colorblind. If just using what he already said about because we've never done anything good around race neutrality, this is why we have to have these things, period. I, so I don't think that's quite Well, that's what pretty said, much what you but... said. Sometimes when I hear some white people say certain things, I'm like, you... You're whining and saying somebody took a spot from you. So do you know how bold and brash that is just to think that that was your spot? Well, we you think that was yours point. in the beginning? And that's the problem that people, especially a lot of white people, don't understand. It's We're already arguing think, a oh, point, though. that's my Case place. Case law has already set precedence. Racism already happened. All this stuff already happened. R redlining already happened. So now how do we fix it? How do we correct the wrongs? That's all we have it's, to do well, to that's, move the country like that's what, forward that's in the what right direction. Was trying what, 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 to do and, and, and so now they want to repeal it. Right, exactly. I understand that, so but then again, we, I don't feel like we can have any law. Forward, listening to moving, these conversations, even listening to these I, two, there is no law that we can have that specifically that, benefit that the black some people. white people will be happy with. I opened this section by talking about actions that the Biden administration has right. taken that they don't are trickle specifically. Down. The law does not said, trickle down to the local and the county levels. It does not. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, I was at, in a round table and one of the women said, do you think that Republicans are more patriotic than Democrats? <laughs> she asked me this question. And it actually really bothered me because 
That's the wrong. I mean, I think that's the, that's a indicative of the way that the conversation is going on. Right. Democrats are saving democracy. Republicans are saving democracy. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be at uh, odds. Uh, at mm -hmm. odds. Right. And I don't think that we are. We're, I think that it's a con, a little bit of a con right. to get us to say to see ourselves as uh, being divided and not to focus on what unites us. And I know that that's cliche it's to say, bait. even that, right? It's, it's a, a, a bit of a, right, it's a bit of a red herring as yes, well. Absolutely. And so I see the race issue, not because I don't see race or that there's racism, just sort of, I'm sort of doing a summary thing, but that what, what else could it be that explains some of these systemic issues? When we go to Milwaukee, when I go to see downtown Milwaukee and I see buildings that are caved in and I see poverty and I see grinding poverty, right. my heart feels for that. I, I, it's not a leap for me to say this sucks and I don't like this. And the women that I meet when they say I have to work two jobs or my kid got beat up at school, it is, there's nothing to do with race that I can relate, that I can relate to that, of course. So my, I keep saying, why are we always looking at race? Not because I'm denying that racism exists. It's a what race bait is, to keep us divided. It is a way Just to like keep us divided. Just like that paper was a, a white supremacy bait to keep, give <laughs> right. us something to argue so, about. Race welcome. is a bait <laughs> to give us something to argue about and okay. keep us divided. So who benefits? But I think that who race... Who benefits? The, people, like, the powers that be. The right. people that's I on think top that want to stay it, in power. I think we know. That's but all I it think is. You, I think to not ask about racism is is faulty. You have, if, if you're looking at a situation or an issue, it's just like if you go to the doctor, they're just trying to rule out a lot of things. Put racism there. If you can rule it out, rule it out. But don't not include it because you don't want to talk about it or because you want it to be something else. That's the thing. Right. I'm not, if you, we're not going to fix it, I'm just going to move on. But I still have the feelings there. But I'm not going, if we're not going to fix we it, it's a waste. I feel like we don't I could be to, making a, something else more to successful. What are you guys voting for? Absolutely. I'm voting there. for Donald that's Trump. The, we don't have the, to live there. I do agree with that. <laughs> we got one Trump voter. Who are you oh, voting for, Rhonda? Donald Trump. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, oh, VP <laughs> Harris all day, all the way. The Indian lady. <laughs> <laughs> She always comes back to that. <laughs> Donald Trump did what no other president has done for us, which was put that money back into the hands of the black people. So where everybody else said they're going to put it up here and let it trickle down to us, he came right here and said, hey, Girl, here's he the money. Not the How about the 580 to... million in recent years that he, he gave to the HBCUs? The How about to those PPP no, loans uh, you used to get check. your business? And How every about American e got that check. That was wasn't just so a black check. It was so much money. That, no, That's but the they, yeah. they put out money all the time for everybody and we don't but get I'm, none. I'm saying so everybody, he put it got in that, our hands. everybody got that stimulus check. He put it in our hands. So the and only, he did the, the only postal thing I would he put it through the mail and you got When it. was the last time that you got a president that even gave the poor people a stimulus? Girl, well, Biden Obama did. Bush, no, and Bush Biden did. didn't give us a stimulus. He was supposed to gave carry everyone. over the All stimulus. Right. Did you hear anything tonight that complicated anything that you came in here thinking? Was there anything you heard? Or, or, or if you didn't, what was the best point that you heard from their side? I think, it's, I think it's always valuable to hear other people's experiences. I don't think we're that far apart. So I don't know that there's these two sides, but. No. Um, I, I would tell you one um, pleasant surprise is, even though you were Trumper mm -hmm. and I would never vote for him, mm -hmm. You, we obviously have definitely some agreement on where black people are, what we want for black people and where we want them to go. Mm -hmm. I can hear that in our Absolutely. conversations. And I appreciate that because that's not always the view that I get or conversations that I have when I encounter um, black Republicans, especially of the Trump variety. <laughs> now... Um, <laughs> oh, it's different ones now. Oh, okay. it, it is. I've heard okay. that. Just because um, people are different. But right. Yeah. I got, when he said the race neutral, I, I'm like, I'm sticking with that. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Well, that's like, great. great. Yeah, Amazing. I, um, when he said, like, okay, let's just be honest here. You know, we really haven't done, we've never been race neutral mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, yes. Huh. We can roll with that. You gave me that. Thank you. Good. Well, I, I, I think, uh, Rhonda, and, and I, I think several people actually today brought up labels and how they can be uh, deceptive. And, and I, I agree with that completely. On, on one hand, you need some labels to be able to talk about this. So you got to put labels on it somehow. But I think that we also need to be very conscientious about how those labels can be 
uh, over-inclusive, under-inclusive, and, and frankly, a lot of times arbitrary. I really appreciate all of this. I could have talked to you all for like another three hours. I had like three times as much material to, oh, to bring to you course. guys. And but we um, took it in you know, lots we of so directions. Huh? We got a lot. <laughs> you guys are great. Just great. So thank you.